Coming up on Global Business, China's Statistics Bureau expects significant acceleration in economic growth in the second quarter of the year. Several leading international business leaders have gathered at the 26th St. Petersburg Economic Forum to explore opportunities in Russia. Countdown to the 19th Asian Games begins as the eastern Chinese city of Hangzhou prepares to host the event in 100 days. From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is Global Business. I'm Michelle Vandenberg. China's major economic indicators posted gains in May, showing resilience despite facing some pressure. According to official data, the value-added industrial output, an important economic indicator, rose 3.5 percent on a yearly basis last month. Meanwhile, retail sales of consumer goods continued to recover, surging 12.7 percent from a year ago. China's fixed asset investment also improved, up 4 percent year-on-year in the first five months of the year. Overall, urban unemployment remained stable at 5.2 percent in May. The officials said some other sectors are also performing well. In the first five months, the index of service production increased 0.7 percentage point, faster than in the first four months. Specifically, index of service production of accommodation and catering grew by 39.5 percent. Retail sales of communication equipment, gold, silver, and jewelry, sports and recreation goods above the designated size grew by 27.4 percent, 24.4 percent, and 14.3 percent, respectively. In the first five months, the total retail sales of consumer goods grew 0.8 percentage point, faster than in the first four months. Housing prices cooled in 70 major Chinese cities during May. According to data from the National Bureau of Statistics, new home prices rose in 46 cities on a monthly basis in May, down from 62 in April, while 15 cities saw growth in second-hand home prices. Prices of second-hand homes fell 0.6 percent on a monthly basis in Beijing, the first monthly drop this year. Officials said that the recovery of the real estate market still faces pressure, with hopes pinned on the improvement of the overall business environment. China's central bank has made a 10 basis point rate cut on its one-year loans to financial institutions, also known as the Medium Term Lending Facility, or MLF. The rate cut will be effective on 237 billion yuan, or $33 billion worth of loans injected into the financial market on Thursday. This is the first MLF rate cut in 10 months. The move comes three days after the central bank lowered two key short-term policy rates. The latest economic data for the month of May suggests that China's economic recovery is ongoing with signs of an upgraded transformation. However, experts warn that domestic structural adjustment is still facing significant pressure. CGTN recently spoke with an economist to discuss the national economic movements and the property markets. There is increasing evidence that the pace of recovery is weaker than expected. The total retail sales of consumer goods in May increased by 12.7 percent, lower than market expectations. The infrastructure investment increased by 7.5 percent year on year, where the growth rate continued to narrow. The real estate investment has decreased by uh, 7.2 percent year on year. The market expects that the government may introduce stimulus policies, such as relaxing purchasing restrictions for first-tier cities and the lowering interest rates for LPR on existing housing loans to support the stabilization of the real estate uh, sector. In May, exports decreased by 7.5 percent year-on-year, and the negative impact of weak external demand has gradually become apparent, increasing residents' disposable income and uh, reducing the unemployment rate especially relieving the employment pressure of graduates, would become the focus of future stimulus policies. Following China's eased COVID precaution measures, executives of some multinational companies have made further business expansion plans on the Chinese mainland. Continuing our series, The China Comeback, our reporter Tang Xiaofan 
spoke to Eric, Eric Rondelat, a CEO and chairman of the board of uh, Signify, a Dutch-based company that leads the world's lighting industry. Hey, you good? Coming to China, you realize the magnitude of the opportunity. It gives a, a renewed you know, energy to go and now try to be present on the market, to make investments you know, in order to capture the fabulous potential that the Chinese market can offer to us. Very happy to be here. Very happy to be back to China after three years and four months. I used to live in China, and I was coming very often to China, probably, you know, three, four times a year. How beautiful is Shanghai, by the way? Did you see how the trees have grown? How little? So I'm very happy to have the opportunity to go back to this uh, great country. And I have to tell you, coming back, I realized how much, you know, I missed the country and how, how much I missed the people. Happy place? Yeah! yeah. You know, uh, probably three years ago when I was here, we had a lot of meetings with the teams when we reviewed, you know, business opportunities, when we discussed about plans for the future. Then I went to visit uh, a factory uh, that we have in Hainin, well, in order to be with the people, to understand, you know, how the new developments in terms of production were happening. So you see a lot of business activities, a lot of connection, you know, with the local market, you know, and local people. I've been on the band. It's very nice because, you know, all the bridges on the band, we have done them in terms of lighting and they're all connected. So the color can change. Every time I come to Shanghai, I go there, not only to see the lighting because it is ours, just because of the vibe, you know, because of the great environment there. Oh, yeah, that's a big deal. <laughs> and that we have also been able to do because of the acquisition that we did of uh, Leifei, you know, in Shenzhen that has given us the capability from a technology standpoint to complement what we had and be able to offer all that uh, to the Shanghai city. Signify has nine factories in China as well as its second largest R&D center. The company's Asia-Pacific headquarters is located in Shanghai. Signify has also established joint ventures with Chinese companies, including the Chinese tech firm Xiaomi. Our role here, it's about business, but it's also about developing a community of people. Yeah, how are you? Good? And we have people today in sales, in marketing, in logistics, you know, in manufacturing, you know, in R&D, and it's very important for us to make sure uh, that we are very much local for local in China, but also China for global. The world has gone into a very, very complicated transition over the past three years, but we see the potential moving forward. I think we're going to contribute and we see a very positive environment in front of us, and we're ready to continue enlarging our presence and invest in China. Tang Xiaofan, SS for CGTN, Shanghai. You're watching Global Business, still to come. Several leading international business leaders have gathered at the 26th St. Petersburg Economic Forum to explore opportunities in Russia. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global Business Reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global Business. Only on CGTN. The International Energy Agency expects global oil demand to slow down significantly in the next few years due to rising prices and concerns over supply. 
In a new report, in IEA said the shift towards cleaner alternatives is expected to accelerate. The agency's latest midterm report shows that global oil demand could rise by 6 percent between 2022 and 2028, with robust demand coming from the petrochemical and aviation sector. However, the annual growth in demand during this period is expected to slow down from 2.4 million barrels per day to just 0.4 million par barrels per day by 2028, indicating that a peak in oil demand might be in sight. Now moving on to news from the European Union. The European Central Bank on Thursday said it will raise its benchmark deposit rates by 25 basis points to 3.5 percent, aligning with market expectations. This decision follows the lender's previous policy meeting and is in contrast with the U.S. Federal Reserve's decision to pause rate hikes on Wednesday. Since last July, the European Central Bank has been raising interest rates in an effort to reduce surging inflation in the bloc. Now let's take a quick look at some top business news from around the world. On Thursday, the European Union has accused Google of online advertising dominance and is recommending that the U.S. tech giant divest part of its highly profitable ad business. Meanwhile, Bill Gates, the co-founder of Microsoft, has arrived in Beijing for his first visit to China since 2019. Gates is expected to meet Chinese President Xi Jinping on Friday, according to Reuters. German tech company Siemens has announced plans to invest 2 billion euros globally to expand its manufacturing capacity. The company will also be expanding its digital factory in Chengdu as part of this plan. The leaders of China and Palestine have announced the establishment of a strategic partnership and promised to boost cooperation across all areas. The news comes as Palestinian President Ahmad Abbas is on a state visit to China. The spokesperson for China's Ministry of Commerce said in a news briefing in Beijing on Thursday that it will continue to work closely with relevant departments in Palestine to promote economic and trade cooperation. The spokesperson also said China is willing to accelerate the negotiation of the China-Palestine Free Trade Agreement and enhance trade and investment cooperation between the two sides. China welcomes Palestine to participate in exhibitions such as the China International Import Expo and the China Arab States Expo, promote Palestine's business environment and distinctive products, continue to implement projects that help Palestine's economic development and improve people's livelihoods, injecting new impetus and making new contributions to the development of China-Palestine strategic partnership. The 26th St. Petersburg International Economic Forum is currently underway in Russia, St. Petersburg. The event, known as the Russian Davos, gathers business people from more than 100 countries and regions. Now, my colleague Zheng Junfeng is on the ground with the latest update from the event. Hi there, Junfeng. Um, first, what are some of the highlights uh, from the forum? Hi, Michelle. Michelle, after eight hours of flight, I went from Beijing to St. Petersburg yesterday and today I'm quite excited because I saw uh, this morning uh, one of the most beautiful, impressive exhibition I've ever seen. I mean, these Russian companies have really uh, demonstrated staggering technology, at least whatever they've shown on this exhibition on the sidelines of the Economic Forum. I talk about St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. Uh, there's not just one forum, but many of them. We're talking about 100 and 200 of these forums. These forums cover uh, almost every aspect of the Russian economy and uh, social society, uh, including the economic recovery, the adaption to the Western sanctions, education, uh, medical care, um, also environmental issues and uh, lots of uh, issues that uh, you may think every country would talk about. They talk about on this uh, uh, St. Petersburg Economic Forum. And on the sidelines, there's demonstrations of a very impressive technologies. And they demonstrated a very uh, beautiful way. And I, <laughs> I'm impressed to say that this is a very uh, beautiful exhibition area. And I've learned a lot, uh, to be honest. And uh, I think the highlight really gives me the impression that the uh, Russian economy is trying to adapt 
through the new norm of Western sanctions. They, they understand the sanctions will stay for a while, at least for actually for many years to come. So they are adapting to this uh, situation and trying to find ways to cope with it to sustain I its economy. And we know China and Russia are, you know, in cooperation in many areas. What are some of these cooperation areas that you see at the forum? Right. On this forum, uh, most of the participants, I have to say, are Russian locals. Uh, the official website states that last year, 13,000 people attended, and this year, the number increased to 17,000. That's why I can see on the exhibition, on the forum, there are so many people, so crowded. I think people are quite excited, not only after uh, the three years of the pandemic, but also because the, the, uh, the Russian economy is showing signs of adaption uh, to the, you know, the Western uh, sanctions. They are welcoming international investments, not from Western countries anymore, because when the uh, US and uh, Western Europe, these Western nations decided to sanction Russia, they leave a huge void or a huge hole in the Russian economy uh, used to invest it by foreign companies, especially Western uh, uh, big companies. So there's a huge void in uh, many areas, including those uh, consumptions in daily use articles, in manufacturing, in machinery, in maintenance, in services, all these voids need to be filled by its local companies and international companies, whether it's Indian company, whether it's African company, Middle East company, Latin American company, or Chinese company. So whoever has the technology edge, whoever has the skills, whoever has the finance, can fill this void and capture uh, growth opportunities uh, together. So earlier today, I talked to the deputy chairman of Spurbank, the biggest commercial bank of Russia, and he told me that the Chinese yuan is fast becoming the biggest currency in the trade settlement between China and Russia. I think that partly answers your question where Chinese and Russia cooperation sits in. Take a listen. So first, to tell about uh, the currency ruble, uh, do you think it's stabilizing? Uh, um, yeah, I, I think it's uh, quite stable now. Uh, there is some fluctuation, but it's for every currency we have some fluctuation up and downs. But it will, I think, stabilize in in, in one or two weeks, it depending uh, on uh, exporters, importers, of so fluctuating like on payments of uh, taxes and so on. Mm. What do you think? is the prospect of China Yuan exchange without any other currency during the trade between the two countries. As I know, the trade volume is now uh, approaching or even exceeding $100 billion. I mean, I'm still pronouncing it in dollars. <laughs> I should be pronouncing it in Yuan or Ruble sometime later. Uh, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, we see that actually Yuan has 28% uh, in export and 18% in imports. Um, and I think till the end of the year, this year, yuan will be number one currency uh, for uh, export and import for Russia. Oh. And it's dramatic change uh, in this uh, entire, uh, entire trade, uh, external trade. Uh, so this is on one hand side. On another hand side, yuan has already uh, beaten uh, Euro and US dollars on the Moscow uh, currency exchange. That's the must uh, tradable, so to say, currency in Russia. And um, I can see you more that uh, our deposits uh, of um, physical people, I mean, those, uh, normal people, uh, growing uh, uh, 120 times uh, in, in a year. So, uh, yuan as a currency now is a currency of choice for Russian people when this person or the people would like to have some uh, savings in, uh, in a foreign currency. Yuan, not USD, not Euro. Right, the bank chief also told me that uh uh, the Russian economy is expected to grow about 1% or 2% this year. 
and the year next. So it's, it looks like uh, the Russian economy is able to sustain itself. So Michelle, if you, uh, like me, fly about eight hours on the plane from Beijing to St. Petersburg, most of the time on the surface, on the air on, of uh, Russian land, you can see how vast this country is. Uh, the, the resource this country has is uh, beyond imagination. So it's understandable that this country can have a kind of sustainability or self-reliance uh, uh, one is uh, successful in adapting to the new situation under Western sanctions. Even the sanctions are very strict in all aspects. And uh, tomorrow at 10 p.m. Moscow time, Russian President Putin is expected to deliver a speech on the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. And that's uh, 1,700 hours Beijing time. I'll bring you the latest. Back to Michelle. Yeah, looking forward to more uh, reports from you from St. Petersburg, Russia, uh, for us. And that seems like an eight-hour um, trip, very worth spent, Jun Feng, for us in St. Petersburg. You're watching Global Business, still to come. Countdown to the 19th Asian Games begins at the eastern Chinese city of Hangzhou as the city prepares to host the event in 100 days. Three hundred sixty degree profiles of industry movers and shakers, tech mavericks, and policymakers. We drill down on their success. We ask how they set strategy and how they navigate in an increasingly competitive market. Real talk, real business. Join the conversation. Biz talk. Only on CGTN. It's 100 days until the 19th Asian Games. The event will open on September 23rd in eastern China's Hangzhou, Zhejiang Province. 56 competition venues and 31 training venues are ready for athletes from 45 countries and regions to compete. Around 52,000 volunteers have been recruited to assist at competition venues as well as games-related sites. The Asian Games flame was ignited and passed on this morning at the archaeological ruins of Liangzhu ancient city in Zhejiang. This is going to be the first carbon neutral Asian Games in its 19 years of history. Our Zhang Huaiming takes you to see the technologies that have helped make the green sports event possible. Go green is one of the guiding principles for the 19th Asian Games Hangzhou 2022. How has this principle been incorporated into the sporting venues? Let's check out three of them to see some of the new technologies adopted to create the very first carbon neutral Asian Games in its history, starting with this one right here behind me, the China Hangzhou Esports Center. The moment you step into the China Hangzhou Esports Center, you'll be amazed by its glittering circular ceiling with a spiraling design. The venue has been held as an interstellar vortex and features a 300 square meter glass skylight, which is able to adjust the temperature inside the building. The skylight uses electrochromic glass, which is capable of regulating the amount of light that enters and thereby can adjust the temperature inside the building, conserving 30% of the energy usage in the process. Additionally, the venue includes a ground source heat pump system that is able to transfer heat beneath the ground from a depth of 80 to 100 meters. If one compares this with the use of conventional air conditioners, this system is able to reduce carbon emissions by more than 30%. The Lingan Culture, Sports and Exhibition Center, where the Taekwondo and wrestling events will be held, has a lighting system that does not require electricity, as 92 light pipes have also been arranged at the top of the venue. The system optimizes the use of natural light which is directed into the room and the brightness can also be adjusted according to the prevailing lighting conditions, thereby using just over 80% less energy. Our maintenance staff can provide regular maintenance services without having to turn the venue's lights on. A large number of the other venues have also applied new technologies to achieve the optimal use of natural resources. 
One good example is the corrugated white roof at the Shaoxing Baseball and Softball Center. Having adopted the most cutting-edge membrane material technology, the roof is able to direct a high amount of natural light and is capable of cleansing itself by using light as a catalyst. The roof's design enables dirt and debris to be naturally washed away when it rains or when water flows over the roof surface. This also saves on the use of detergents that may be a source of secondary pollution. Zhang Huanming, ZTV News for CGTN. As millions around the globe face the threat of famine, degradation of arable land is among the many challenges complicating efforts to secure food supplies. However, scientists are employing artificial intelligence to streamline crop hydration, offering farmers the much-needed information on what to, when, and how to save their crops. CGTN's Stephanie Freff reports on how Israel is tackling the issue. 2022 wasn't a good year for Israel's avocado industry. It was the coldest winter in half a century. Harvests yielded half the volumes of 2021. Climate-driven drought and extreme heat are cutting yields across the globe. From North Africa's wheat crops suffering a fourth year of losses to weaker harvests in Tunisia, Portugal, Spain, and beyond. As the climate changes, so do the rules. The table says on January, this is how much you need to irrigate. And on February, that, but January and February have dramatically changed over the last 10, 15 years. To stay ahead of dramatic climactic shifts, agronomists are increasingly relying on sensors and monitors to give them data that helps them optimize cultivation and growth. It feels the breathing of the tree all day long. This is transmitted to our server every 10 minutes. Plants are talking all day long, and it's all about listening for them. Artificial intelligence plant talk translations tell farmers when trees or crops are in the early stages of a disease, when they're stressed out, or they need a water infusion. In addition to improving hydration efficiency, sensors potentially save farmers hundreds of millions of dollars. Agriculture is one industry that can benefit most from applied AI but policy and practice have to also be in place. Scientific uh, findings will change some of, uh, of the ways and help us fight this crisis, but it has to come uh, together with a, a change starting from the individual behavior to uh, governments. That means tighter government controls over waste disposal, pollution and carbon emissions, and raised individual awareness when it comes to consumption and waste. Stephanie Fried, CGTN, Central Israel. And that will do it for this edition of Global Business here on CGTN. I'm Michelle Lindenberg in Beijing. Thank you for watching. Bye for now.